You know, there are a lot of problems with religion. I mean, you think about it, the history of religion, it's downright embarrassing. There, there's all kinds of horrible things that have been done in the name of religion. <clears throat> You've got the Spanish Inquisition, where in the name of God, they would arrest and torture people if they used the wrong kind of wafer in communion. In the 7th century, you've got Muslims persecuting and mur murdering Jewish people, saying, God wills it, God wills it. And then you've got the Crusades that took place in the Middle Ages, and where Pope Urban you know, tells Christians to wipe out all the Muslims in the Holy Land. It's basically an ethnic cleansing kind of deal. And catch this, they promised that every person who signed up to go on a crusade or, or even was on the way to do a crusade would have immediate remission of their sins. And so people thought, noblemen and different people went on, hey, this is great. You know, most of the sermons back there were hellfire and damnation. You know, and, hey, this is great. If I go on this crusade, I, I, I can just sin like crazy and still go to heaven. Isn't that great? And so they did just that. I'm sorry about that. Uh, they send their way all through France, all through, through Germany, and they, until they got to Constantinople, and they, they you know, murdered about a 1,000 or so Jews, and they went on down to Jerusalem and just murdered every Muslim in sight and took over the city. And they're thinking, hey, we can do whatever we want. I'm on crusade. You know, my sins have been absolved. I, I, I can just, I can gonna go to heaven no matter what, so I can just live any old way I want. Wow. Religion has a lot of problems, but it's not just back then, okay? It's also now in our era, too. Today, in the name of religion, you know, sometimes we get some really goofy stuff. You know, it just kind of borders on the superstitious and all. And, you know, one, one morning, some, some gal's uh, cooking some pancakes, and she's cooking along, and she flips that can, and there is the face of Mary in the pancake, Okay? And suddenly, people are lining up for blocks for a mile long to see Mary of the Pancake. And that's just kind of goofy, isn't it? I mean, sometimes it's just really strange. And how did they know it was Mary anyway? I mean, there were no photographs, there were no pictures. Maybe it was Debbie. Maybe, maybe it was Liz. I, we just don't know. But on a much more serious note, you know, more devastating note, today, you know, religious leaders who they've been, have, have abused their position and, uh, and authority and ha have done sexual things to little boys and girls, and, and getting away with it was just like a slap on the wrist. And today, we have all kinds of televangelists who, who get on TV and guilt people into sending them millions of dollars, which they use to buy for themselves huge mansions, just not one or two, but lots of mansions. And they buy corporate jets and Rolls Royces and, and Bentleys and on and on. And all that's done in the name of religion. Consequently, Looking at some of the crazy, off-the-wall things that go on in religions, a lot of people are just turned off by religion. And they just kind of think, man, if, if that's what religion is all about, I want nothing to do with it. Well, guess what? If you feel that way, you happen to be in very good company because Jesus was turned off by religion too. And whenever you pull out your Bible and you start reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, the Gospels, and, and you just kind of see that Jesus is in this kind of running gun battle with the religious leaders of his day. And the scribes and the Pharisees, what had happened? They had completely distorted and perverted the Jewish faith. And what they had done is they'd taken, you know, all the Old Testament laws, and they've added to those laws hundreds and hundreds of additional laws of ways to obey those original laws. And you'd have to do those things or you couldn't really be righteous. And the Pharisees, you know, they started off well-intended, you know, but they quit focusing on loving God and having a relationship with Him, and they got fixated on self-righteously keeping all these rules and all these regulations. And consequently, they became very religious. And they thought that, you know, that, that they followed the rules 
better than anybody else. And they looked down on people they considered less righteous than they were. And, and they thought because they were so outwardly good, because on the outside externally looked so good, that surely God accepted them. And they just loved the adoration of the crowds. They loved people thinking, oh, there goes that Pharisee. He is so righteous. He's so good. He's so holy. And consequently, the Pharisees would hide their horrendous sins that they knew were inside. And consequently, they were giant hypocrites. These are the men who killed Jesus. And this really, this whole religiosity just turned Jesus off. In fact, the harshest things Jesus ever said were directed at these very religious leaders. In Matthew 23, boy, that's a blistering, blistering account. And Jesus just blasts, I mean, no holes barred. He just blasts them saying some incredible things. I'll, I'll read a couple of them to you, not the whole part, but you get the picture. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the far more important matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former, you blind guides. You strain out a gnat, you pretend with all these nitpicky little rules, but you swallow a camel. You miss the big things, the most important things. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! Hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs. Okay, in our area, we know that whitewashed tombs, okay? We've got them here. Uh, you're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. It goes on to call them, you brood of vipers. Whoo! They were very religious, but they were very lost. They were religious, but they had no relationship with God. And so the truth is, in order to find God, you have to lose your religion. Well, what is religion? What am I talking about religion? You know, there's some good religions, man religion, but religion is basically that. It's trying to do good things. It's trying to not do bad things in order, here's the catch, you're doing all this stuff in order to gain God's favor, in order to, to cause God to love you because of all the good stuff you're doing, in order to earn his approval. And according to what the Bible teaches us, religion, it doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. You will never ever find God that way. So we kind of need to cut through some of the religious baloney out there and, and that, that sometimes just get piled on and piled on to, to, to real Christianity. And we need to kind of just cut through all that and just focus on Jesus. And we need to listen to what he has to say about what it means to come to know God and how to believe in God and, and following him. So what we want to do this morning, we want to see that the way to find God is through the gospel according to Jesus. And we're going to look at a lot of different verses, but the main verse we're going to look at is just one short, brief verse, John chapter 10, verse 9. And these words in John 10, 9, it just kind of beautifully summarizes the heart and soul of the message. And in this verse, we see the gospel according to Jesus. So first of all, then we see that Jesus is the one and only way to heaven. Here's what Jesus says in John 10, 9. I am the gate. Some translations say I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Now, in John 10, just to understand what's going on here, this whole chapter, it's talking figuratively about how Jesus is the good shepherd. Remember Psalm 23, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus is saying he is the shepherd of God's people. 
Now, back in the, uh, the, the times of the, the New Testament and Old Testament, you know, out in the pasture where the sheep were, uh, the, the shepherds had the, uh, this kind of enclosure, a big pen, where they could keep the, the sheep in and where they could come in uh, and, and rest during the night and that kind of thing. And the shepherd, there's only one entrance. There's one, one little place where you could go in and out of this, uh, this sheep pen, and the shepherd would stand right there where they're going at, or at night he would lie down over that place, and he served as the gate. He served as the door, and the sheep can only get into the safety of the pen by going through the shepherd, okay? So Jesus uses this picture of shepherding, a, a, a picture, something that all of his audiences who were listening were very, very familiar with, and he says, I, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. And Jesus is clearly saying that he is the one and only way to heaven. And that the only way to God was through him. A few chapters later, in the very familiar uh, uh, John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Same phrase, through me. See, Jesus didn't just come to teach us a way. He said, I am the way. And he didn't come to just teach us truth. He says, I actually am the truth. He didn't come to tell us about life. He came to give us life, abundant life, eternal life. As the great uh, theologian Karl Barth said, Jesus does not give recipes that show the way to God as other teachers of religion do. He is himself the way. Now, <clears throat> come on, let's get real. This really bothered people when they, you know, when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truck, nobody can come through me. I mean, they was the one to pick up stones and, and, and kill him, you know. Because to make this claim, I am the only way anybody can get to heaven. That is an, out, an absolutely outrageous claim for anybody to make unless that person was, in fact, the Son of God. Unless that person was, in fact, God incarnate, God in the flesh who had no beginning and no end. It would be a crazy, outrageous claim to say you're the only way to heaven unless that person happened to be the Messiah who, who, whom was, his coming was, was predicted in prophecies and he perfectly fulfilled in, in precise and detailed ways uh, his coming. And the prophecies that were written hundreds of years before he was born. You know, you can't make that kind of claim, you know, unless you have lived a perfect life. It would be an outrageous claim unless that person performed astounding miracles. Not one or two or three, but, but many, many who were attested to by thousands of people. Inexplicable, I mean, on a scale of one to ten, ten kind of miracles. Unless that person who made this outrageous claim, unless he was, predicted his own death and resurrection and then was buried in a tomb dead for three days and then he rose from the dead and gloriously reappeared to over 500 different people over a period of 40 days, you know, uh, unless you make a claim like that, you know, you better not make a claim like that. Well, Jesus did all of that. And what that means is that therefore... Unlike any other religious leader in the history of the world, he's got the credentials to say that, yes, I'm it. I'm the only way you can come and get to heaven. And so Peter, one of the disciples, you know, that, that was there for the entire three years of Jesus' ministry, and he witnessed all these miracles, and he heard all that Jesus had to say, and he saw him dead on the cross, and he saw him victoriously risen. He confidently states in Acts 4.12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Okay, that's the first part of the gospel according to Jesus. He's the only way. Next thing that is really critical to understanding the gospel according to Jesus is this, is that the only gospel is the gospel of grace alone through faith alone. 
See, the Apostle Paul, you know, he went on all these missionary journeys, and he established all these different churches, different places, you know, as people came to faith in Christ. And uh, inspired by God, you know, he, he taught them that, hey, listen, nobody's good enough to be saved. In fact, all of us, every single human being ever born has fallen way, 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 way short of making it into heaven because nobody's perfect. Nobody's been perfectly good. And that is why Jesus came. He came to pay for all of our sins so that we wouldn't have to be separate from God forever. And that the way that we get this forgiveness of sin, this free gift, all we have to do is receive it by faith, by simply believing, by trusting that who Jesus was, what he did, and just saying, come into my life, God, be my Savior. That's it. You see, salvation, listen, it's not a matter of working in order to be accepted by God. It's not a matter of deserving it in any way because nobody deserves it. It's by grace alone through faith alone. But here's what happened. After Paul, you know, had established his churches, you know, and he's in Galatia, along come these, these Jewish guys who claim that they've become Christians, and they're known as the Judaizers. And they come into the, the, uh, the Galatian towns and say, oh, we're so glad you've become believers. You know, glad, you know, I've accepted Jesus. That's all great. But Paul didn't really give you the whole story. You know, in order to really be saved and really to be righteous, you really be approved by God, you have to do all the things in the Old Testament that the Jewish people do. I know you're Gentiles, but you know, you got to do all this. You got to kind of become a Jew in order to become a Christian. And you got to obey all the Jewish laws and you got to eat certain foods, just kosher stuff. And, and I hate to say it, guys, but you grown men, you're going to have to be circumcised, you know, if you want to go to heaven. And you have to do all the Jewish feasts and all this, and what they were doing. Here's what they're doing. They were adding requirements to how you get to heaven. That is a no-no. That, that's just something you cannot do. So Paul, man, he catches wind of, of this, and he is hot. I mean, these are his sheep. You know, these are the people he's led to the Lord, and he's a stand. And here are these guys come along and trying to mess up the whole thing. So he writes them a little letter. And he's a little ticked off. He's righteously ticked off, but he is ticked off. And here's what, here's what Paul says in Galatians 1. I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ. Hear that grace of Christ. Uh, and are turning to a different gospel, which really it's no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion or trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But listen, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned i.e., let him go to hell. That, that's, that's what he's saying. And these words, inspired by God, that God has preserved for us today, they are a strong, a clear, unambiguous words. The true gospel, the gospel according to Jesus, is that the only thing we need for eternal life is to believe in Jesus. Everybody knows John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever should believe in him should not perish. In John 6, somebody asked Jesus, Well, what works? What do we need to do, Jesus? What do we need to do? In verse 29, he says, Well, the work of God is this, to believe the one he sent. But these Judaizers, you know, they're adding works as requirements for salvation. And church, that is not the gospel. That is a dog that won't hunt. This is a different gospel, which is no gospel. No gospel means good news. This is bad news. It's not good news. It's a terrible perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that perverted, that distorted gospel of works, tragically, it will save nobody. Nobody. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we talk about it all the time. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, doing things, trying to do things to get God to love you. Not by works so that nobody can boast. Yeah, 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 I, kn I know that Jesus paid for all my sins, you know, I, but, but come on, I still have to do some things to be worthy, right, to, to kind of get in, and I, I've got to kind of chip in and do my part to add to what Jesus did, and then together, maybe I'll get in, right? 
wrong. No, that is precisely the point. Grace says Jesus did it all. There's nothing else we can do. All other religions, we've talked about this before, with all other religions are basically spelled D-O, do. You got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do that, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that, all that kind of thing, D-O, okay? Christianity, boy, this is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world because according to Jesus, you know, it's not spelled D-O. It's spelled D-O-N-E, done. It is done. Jesus has done it all. That's what grace is about, guys. That's the grace of the gospel. And listen, if you try to add works to grace to be saved, you destroy grace. It's no longer grace. You know, grace is unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor from God. There's not one thing you can do to get it. He just gives it to you. You just receive it by faith. Now, listen, this is an incredible verse. Romans eleven six. 6, Paul's talking about salvation. And, and, and he says this, And if by grace, if salvation is by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. You see, see uh, grace and works are kind of mutually exclusive. It's either by works, it's stuff that you do to earn your salvation, or it's by grace. It's what God does. It can't be both works and grace. The only gospel, the one true gospel, the gospel according to Jesus, the one gospel that's going to get you to heaven is the gospel of grace alone plus faith alone. Okay, here's something else that's really important about the gospel according to Jesus. Here it is. See on your outline. The true gospel opens the door to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. True gospel opens the door to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Back to John 10, verse 9. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved through me. Get that? Not through my teaching, not through my church. Not through knowing a lot about the Bible, but through me. Through me. It's a personal relationship. Later on in the chapter, Jesus says, you know, in John 10, 14, I'm the good shepherd. I, what? Know my sheep. And what about the sheep? They know me. In the upper room, you know, the night before Jesus was crucified, he's praying for the church. He's praying for the disciples and you and me. And he prays in John 17, 3. He says, now this is eternal life, that they may, what? Know you, the only true God, and know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So knowing Jesus, having a personal uh, knowledge of him, a, a personal relationship with him, that's what it's all about. Now, listen to this. This is a little scary. Isn't it interesting that in Matthew 7, Jesus is talking about who's going to make it into the kingdom and who's not going to make it into the kingdom? Listen to what he says. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly. Okay, what does he say? Well, what's the reason why you, you know, he can, their, their will or will not go to heaven? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Never knew you. See, guys, we're not talking about church membership. We're not, we're, you know, back in the third century, there was this heresy that started that said, hey, there's no salvation outside of the church. And in other words, if you were not on the rolls, if you were not a recognized member of the church, you, you couldn't go to heaven. And it started out okay, but, you know, as the years went by throughout the history of the church, salvation became not so much a matter of having your heart in the right place with Jesus as much as having your paperwork in order. Uh, okay, you know, some people today, they have that, that, that same kind of attitude. They say, you know, okay, well, I'm a Christian because I was baptized the right way. I don't remember it, but I was baptized the right way. I, I'm a Christian because I went through a class and I got confirmed, you know, I went to the baptism class of the pastor and, you know, I got confirmed. Or I'm a Christian because I filled out a card at, the, at this tent revival thing and I filled out the card and, you know, you know and that, that was a long time ago. But, hey, I'm, I'm a Christian. Guys. Being a Christian, it's not about paperwork. It has nothing to do with that. It's about a personal relationship with Christ. It's about 
knowing him. Not knowing about him. It's about knowing him. You know, I know a lot of information about Julie Jemison over there. I know where she was born. I know what color eyes she has. I know she makes the best brownies in the universe. Can I have an amen on that? Okay, okay, okay. But I don't just know about Julie. I know Julie. I know her tender heart. And I know how she feels about God. And I know if I'm with, I know what's bothering her if I'm with her for two seconds. I can just see, I know what's bothering her. I know her so well. I know the heartache she experienced of walking through the valley of the, the death of her firstborn child. I know the joy she's experiencing over having her first grandson. We have been married, coming up in August, 43 years. And we have a close, we have a deep, we have a personal relationship with each other. That's a relationship. That's not just knowing about her. That's a relationship. And that's what Jesus wants with you. He he, he wants you to know him personally, not just know a lot of Bible facts, Know him personally. What do you think the number one priority in the Christian life is? Is it being good? That's, that's important. Is it being doctrinally sound? That's need to do that. Is it knowing a lot of facts about the Bible? Well, we do need to know the Word. Is it about going to church every Sunday? Yeah, that's important to code. Is it about witnessing to a lot of people? That's a great commission. That's important. What's the number one priority in the Christian life? Well, the Apostle Paul knew what was important to him. He, he knew what was number one for him, and, and I think what he thinks is probably pretty true for you and me as well. You see, Paul, uh, he was a type A personality, if there ever was one. I mean, he, he, he was just, he was, had accomplished a lot. He was a go-getter with a tremendous drive. He was a Pharisee, man. He rose to the top. He was voted in 34 AD as the most zealous Pharisee of the year. Not really, but he could have been. I mean, if they'd had a vote, he probably would have gotten it. He obeyed the Jewish laws better than anybody else. He had accomplished a lot. He had power. He had fame. He had position. He was highly esteemed and respected and admired by the Jewish community. But then Paul met Jesus one day, and all that changed. All that changed. In Philippians 3, he, he writes about what became the new number one priority of his life. He says, Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. And then a final part of the gospel, according to Jesus, is personally knowing Jesus as your Savior, you learn to walk in step with him day by day. Walk in step with him day by day. Back to John 10, 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Now, what's that talk? What's this coming in and going out? You know, sheep would come in and out of that little enclosure and stuff. You know, they go through Jesus and all. But but the going in, I I think it's talking about going in to be with Jesus. You know, going into that that sheep pen. It's his sheep pen. And you spend spend time with him. That's when you go in with him and you you worship like you've been worshiping this morning. And 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 when you pray to him and talk to him and when you read his word and let him talk to you and through meditation and through fellowship with other believers, that's going, going in or coming into Christ. Going out is us going out into the world to serve him. When you go to work, you're going out to be his representative in this dark, broken world. When you step foot on your school campus, you are going out into the world to be his representative. When you spend an evening with friends, you go to a movie, whatever, you're going out as a Christ follower. 
And then when you go out, those are the times when we show compassion to people in need. You know, those are the times when we show mercy to people who don't usually get mercy and probably don't deserve it. And, and that's those times when we speak truth to people who, who do not believe in truth. And going out is, is to show what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ in your sphere of influence uh, with those people who are looking perhaps desperately to find some kind of sense, some kind of meaning, some kind of purpose in their life. But you're going out, that's just not going to be all very effective if you're not going in. We're not spending time, not just to have my little quiet time and check it off for the day. Oh, here's money. Let's check off. Yeah. No, you're going, you're going in to, to spend time with Jesus and, and just to get to know him better, to fall in love with him more deeply. You know, some of you here this morning may have listened to this message and, and you know, it's kind of dawned you. You kind of come to the reali- realization that, you know, I've got religion, but I'm not sure about this personal relationship thing. Some of you may be listening today, and you may have come to the realization that you've been fighting a frustrating, exhausting, losing battle of trying and failing and trying, failing and trying, failing to be good enough to make it to heaven. And to you, who you are frustrated that way, Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, directly to your heart, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened by all these pharisaical laws and, and legalistic requirements. Come to me. Come to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. You are my all. You're the best. You're my joy. You're my righteousness. Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world so that we could know him and know you. Lord, we know that none of us had a ghost of a chance of ever having any hope of being good enough to make it to heaven. And you knew that, God. And that's why you went to the extreme measure of sending your son to die on that cross just so we could have a relationship with you. Father, I just pray for those here this morning who, who maybe have religion, but they need to exchange their religion in for a relationship with you. Father, I pray for those who, who may know about you, but they've never really met you personally. And Father, I just pray that that uh, any of those people, Lord, who walked in this morning would walk out differently, that they would accept you into their lives. And so, Father, if someone here is here this morning and they, they don't have a personal love relationship with you, I pray that they would just quietly, from the, from the quietness of their, their seats, their pews, to just talk to you and say to you, God, I, I realize that I am a sinner. I've not got it all right. I've done some things I'm ashamed of. God, I haven't even lived up to my own standards. And I realize, God, that because I'm that way, I'm, I've been separated from having a relationship with you. But God, I, I, I hear, I, I see that you did something about that. That you love me so much that you, you sent Jesus into this world as the God-man and that he died on that cross to pay for not some of my sins, not most of my sins, but all of my sins. So Lord, I thank you for that. And God, I just want to let you know this morning, right now, I want to put a stake in the ground and say, God, I believe you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he is God himself and that his death did pay for my sins, every one of them. And so God, I just don't understand everything, but God, I I just want to receive you into my life. I'm going to accept this free gift. I want to grow in my understanding of all of this. So thank you, Lord, for coming into my life. 
thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for being my righteousness. And Father, if there may be some of us here this morning that in the busyness and the distractions and the worries and anxieties of this world, we've kind of kind of drifted off from our, our close relationship with you. And we've gotten busy and I just pray, Father, that you would bring us back. Lord, just, just pray that you would just be like a magnet that just draws us back to you and want to be back in fellowship with you and back living life with you at the very center of it. Father, we too just pray this morning for anyone who's, who's perhaps lost a job or is on the verge of losing a job. But Lord, may you be their provider. May you be their strength and their courage. We thank you, Father, for being here with us today. We look forward to next week in Jesus' name.